I'm Matt, and I'm an enemy of religion. That's, that's probably all the introduction I ever need or want. Uh, I'm an enemy of all religions equally. I despise Christianity, Islam, Scientology. Oh, I'm not an enemy of Scientology. I'm just a person. person. So, uh, the, uh, it says in your program, I, I got a copy, so I know it says it, uh, that I'm going to talk about the superiority of secular morality. Um, atheists are liars. Uh, here's what happened really briefly. Uh, they asked me if I do that talk, and I said, yeah, I'd love to. And then I looked at the schedule, and it's 30 minutes, and for those of you who've seen it, uh, it's online, by the way. It's an hour, and I've taken questions for two hours afterwards. By the way, who here already has a question that they wanted to ask me? Okay, so there's at least a couple, because I'm going to try to make sure that I get the questions. Uh, I desperately tried to shorten the talk. It just wasn't working. Morality is a big deal. And it's really hard to put together in 20 minutes. This is the way you, you, know, you form a concise secular moral system. And by the way, we disagree on a lot of this amongst ourselves. Uh, during PZ's talk, the, the subject of objective morals came up. Um, I happen to think that we can have objective moral values. Uh, and, I, and I talked about that in, in, as well. But let me tell you a little bit about what's been going on and why I find this topic so important. Uh, as Cowan mentioned, I end up doing a lot of debates on the TV show because it's a live calling show. Uh, six years of that, and you know, it's it, you can pretty much answer anything, uh, or at least bullshit your way through the ones that you can't answer. But it's not the same debating with somebody on the phone as it is debating with somebody in person. And it's definitely different from debating in a formal environment like a university. And I've been doing more and more of those the last couple of years. The first debate was at UMBC against a, an Orthodox priest uh, named uh, Father Hans Jacobsy. And the subject was the source of human morality. And Jacobsy was really interesting because throughout the entire debate, um, I spoke first and he spoke last. And he agreed with me on everything. He was, he was acknowledging that yes, secular people can reach correct moral positions through purely secular means. And I was kind of dumbfounded because I had come to debate. I'm, 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 I might be a little bit of a firebrand sometimes and I was looking forward to you know, him saying something that just was crazy. Uh, I got my wish actually, because in his closing remarks, which came at the end of the debate where I wouldn't be able to respond, I saw the most bizarre Jekyll and Hyde transformation I have ever witnessed. I kid you not, you can watch the debate online after agreeing with me, after saying that Matt's not like these other atheists because he's an honest truth seeker, like the rest of you are. Get on the ball, we gotta find that truth stuff. Um, after talking about how, what a nice guy I was and how I'm the kind of person that he'd like to go out and have a beer with and talk about stuff, um, he gets up in his clothing, closing, uh, I'm obsessed by the outfit he had on. <laughs> he gets up in his closing and says, start, first of all, he started ranting about porn for no, just out of the blue. <laughs> the audience was like, what's going on? And then he said in no uncertain terms, secularism necessarily leads to eugenics, gulags, and Nazis. And I lost my shit. <laughs> because I can't answer him. Thank you. Come on in. The debate at this point is effectively over, except there's a Q&A session. And I love me some Q&A. And fortunately, the, uh, the second question, or maybe the third question that came in, was basically somebody who had watched my mouth drop and wanted to give me the opportunity to address this pious old fool. And they basically asked, hey, what do you think of this closing? <laughs> <laughs> they, they phrased it a little bit better than that. But um, I went ahead with it, and I said that uh, I, I, I educated him very nicely that there was no way in hell I would drink beer with anybody who was so dishonest as to flip-flop like that, agree with me through an entire debate, and then in a closing that I could respond to, do one of the most immoral things I've ever seen, which is lie about secularism. Uh, I, they liked that. He didn't. <laughs> um, continuing the trend of debates about morality, uh, I debated uh, Mark uh, Say, I think his name was Amanda Hong, in Gainesville, Georgia, 
on um, can you be good without God? And um, yeah, you can. <laughs> and Marx said so, right in the debate. He completely agreed. Of course secular people can be good. Everybody knows this, by the way. There is no real debate on this subject. And what we've seen in recent years is those who are, who are attacking morality, and I'll talk about what they actually say, are taking a different tack on this now. They agree. Of course you can be a moral person. And Mark agreed with me. Mark and I got along famously. We agreed on like everything. There was no debate there. And Mark and I did go out and have a drink afterwards, uh, you know, because I like people who agree with me. <laughs> I mean, how can you argue with a demonstration of sagacity like that? Uh, I, also, I also like people who don't agree with me. And I didn't want to be the guy who just debated morality. I'm walking a lot because my knee hurts. Um, I went to a debate in Amarillo, or I was debating in Amarillo, a guy by the name of Abu Murray. And the subject this time was something that had never, nobody ever suggested we debate before. And it was, should America be a nation under God? And I was thrilled. I was, yes, I don't have to debate morality again. I get to debate something. It's not, does God exist? It's not, is the Bible true? It's not, did Jesus exist? Which I can't wait for the talks I'm rushing. Um, it's should, it's a should question. Should America be a nation under God? And I prepared and got all ready and picked up all the arguments. And Abdu got up in his opening remarks and said, yes, we should be a nation under God because the Declaration of Independence says so. It, 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 it says that we have inalienable rights that are guaranteed by God. Oh, yeah, and without God, we can't be moral. And we spent the rest of the night waiting <laughs> You'll sense a trend because I am as well. Two weeks ago, I had the great privilege of debating uh, in Texas, in, or in Frisco, Texas, uh, J.C. Everhart and I teamed up against two philosophy theologian, I don't know. Um, this time, the subject was, does God exist? And we, I won't go, the debate should be, it should be up tomorrow. Didn't they say we were supposed to tomorrow, maybe? Someday. I love me some student groups, but boy, you guys and your timetables. It's all right. Study. It's more important. So we, uh, we, did, we did the debate, and basically the opening, there were two. We each had 10 minutes, and they went first. Um, and they presented eight formal, structured arguments for the existence of God. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> And two of them were the moral argument. <laughs> Each of them presented their own version of the moral argument. That's how important this is. That's how much of a big sticking point this is. Last week, because I'm a tireless son of a gun, I was debating in Binghamton, New York, a guy by the name of Jay Lucas. And this time, the topic was also, does God exist? Uh, I tried to pick up the slack that uh, I had let J2 do some of the heavy lifting in the other debate on the, on the specifics while I went after kind of the debate at a meta level. And so I had to do all that work by myself. Uh, I think I'm just taking it with me wherever I go. But okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got a guest room, Beth, I'll put you up there right away. Um, so I, I debated Jane Lucas on Does God Exist? You'll believe this, because, well, I'm honest and I would have told this story if we hadn't gotten here. But Jay's a presuppositionalist. Ooh, there's the groans. I don't know why precepts bother to debate the existence of God if all they're going to do is stand up and say that God exists, and I'm beginning with that. Um, I don't know why they picked precepts to debate with me because I, I came prepared for something else. We had a 20-minute opening statement. By the way, there's something backwards about debates. Anybody else is doing debates? We need to make opening statements about five and the first rebuttal about 20 because they can say so much in a minute that you can't possibly respond to. <laughs> Jay got up and said, uh, Jay gave a 20-minute sermon on how God is required in order for us to be moral. That was it. There wasn't a thing in there about God exists. My, my rebuttal, um, because I, my, I got up for the rebuttal and I said, so basically Jay's argument is God has to exist or we don't live in the world that I want to live in. And then I went on to address all of his claims about morality. Basically, I said, you know, I didn't come here to debate morality, but I will, because that's the trend. I, I mentioned all this, and it was back then. By the way, Jay also made the appeal to gulags. Drives me crazy. 
Jay's a nice guy. The Father James is a dick. But <laughs> Jay's a nice guy because he came out with this from the beginning and was honest. And this is his sincere position. And by the way, he's not an idiot. Um, I wasn't an idiot for the 20 some odd years I was a Christian. I was just wrong. And you can make an argument that I'm smarter now, depending on how you find smarter, based on you know, knowledge and understanding. Um, but don't make the mistake of believing that everybody, everybody who believes is a Christian. I was actually talking to John Loftus earlier um, about the possibility that some of the smarter people are the ones who are really most significantly entrenched in their beliefs. And most deluded, yeah. Because <clears throat> I think if it's crazy enough, you can't ration your, ration your way through it. You know, this, I, I can't get reason through this because it's so crazy. <laughs> but um, I've got another debate upcoming in Campus British Columbia, uh, the Imagine No Religion 2 conference, and I'm paired with Chris DiCarlo, who some of you may be familiar with. And this debate is going to be on the existence of God, but I bet it's on morality. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm preparing for morality. The point is, this isn't going away. This is a big deal. This is a major sticking point, even though it should be. And I called Beth after the debate, and I said, what the hell is going on? Why am I the morality guy? Why am I, you know, people show up, and it's like, it's like they watched the previous debate and didn't, you know, when Father James was getting booed by the audience, they thought that was a good idea, so let's go back and talk about gulags again. <laughs> Who thinks like that? And my wife, being, you know, a little wiser than I, by the way, I got this bitch. Promote our podcast. Um, those, those are the three women I love more than anybody, well, almost anybody else. My wife Beth and then Tracy and Jen for the show. They're doing amazing stuff. Um, but she reminded me that the moral argument is what kept me a theist the longest. Uh, there was a period of time my uncle is a medical missionary. Some of you may have heard uh, the story. He was the wisest Christian in our family and the person anybody would go to when they had questions. Um, and I had a roommate who was an atheist at the time, and even though we agreed not to discuss it, I went to my uncle and I said, hey, I got my roommate, he's an atheist, what do I do about that? You know, I really don't want, I love this guy, I don't want to see him in hell. I'm, I'm a Christian at the time, I'd been kind of backslidden, but, you know, I didn't, didn't want my best friend to end up in hell. And my uncle looked at me and said, ask him where he gets his morals from. And I went, well, duh. <laughs> That's, a, why had, that's amazing. This is where my head was. This is where their head is. It's, it's obvious. It was, when he said it, it was like light bulbs went off. And now it's like I stepped in manure. <laughs> I, I don't understand. I can't. I can put my Christian thinking cap back on for a number of issues. And I can get up and sermonize. And during the debate with Jay, we went around and around about slavery where he flat out lied. And I started to quote the Bible and asked, even asked to borrow his. But I can't put myself back in that mindset on every issue. And this one about morality is probably one of the biggest ones where it's, where it's painful. I can't even remember how or why I thought that way. And I think it's because I didn't used to think about it. Um, what religion does, religion has controlled the conversation on morality for just about as long as we've been able to think about morality. It makes all the definitions it sets the playing field, and it does so because it offers the illusion of certainty and the comfort of simplicity. Murder's wrong, God said so, boom, I'm done thinking about it. Boy, this morality stuff's really easy, isn't it? <laughs> the truth is, morality can be really difficult. There's a lot of things that we can sort out that are, that are relatively simple. You know, we can, we can get the murder thing done, but. We're going to keep having debates for a long time about all these gray zone issues. And it's not going to get any easier. When we start advancing scientifically where we can do things that affect how humans interact and how we define identity, there's a big mess coming. We've got to break free of these antiquated ideas. You can build a secular moral system from very, very simple beginnings. You can begin with things like life is generally preferable to death, pleasure is generally preferable to pain, health is generally, generally preferable to sickness. Um, and it doesn't matter one bit if these are ultimately arbitrary things that we plucked out of nowhere, or if they're intuitions, or if they're about our, don't do that. <laughs> or if they're about our emotions. 
It doesn't matter where this came from. We hang on to them because they have proved to be useful and true. We evaluate the consequences of our actions with respect to specific goals. That's how we determine right and wrong. It's not a simple, I don't like that, that's, that's wrong. It's a lot more complex than that. But it's not so complex that we're stuck. There's a lot of objections that religionists will lodge at secular morals. One of them is that without God, you have no objective standards. Um, I completely disagree. The truth about human interaction isn't contingent on any single line. I'm being very specific with my subjective and objective definitions here. When I say that something is subjective, that means it's contingent on a single line. I think it, it's objective if it's not. And that what I mean by that is that we're physical beings who occupy a physical universe. The laws of the universe control how we interact, control how we think, what we do. And if I set you on fire, it's the physical laws of the universe that are, that are determining everything about that action. And we can assess it objectively. If we live in a universe where fire didn't burn, but was you know, cooling and pleasant and orgasmic, all of a sudden that wouldn't be immoral. Uh, I think you can have objective standards. I think that, the, well, let me get to the, the second objection, which is tied to this, which is, well, without God, it's all relative. You have no absolutes. You're, you say that uh, this is right, and he says that that's wrong. How do you resolve that? Hello, your God solution doesn't solve that either. You're pretending to have solutions to problems that you don't have. Religion has no viable solution to this problem. The only place where you can possibly find a viable solution is in secular moral systems. Every religion disagrees with every other religion. And then within a religion, you've got denominations that disagree. And then you, within denominations, you've got churches that disagree. And within churches, you've got people that disagree. And by the way, even if that wasn't the case, even if religious, religion was some monolithic God said so, guess what? God said so. I disagree. Solve that conflict. <laughs> Why do I care? <laughs> Why do I care what your God has to say? You need to make a demonstration that there's some good reason for me to listen to the authority. And how do you do that? You do it by evaluating the consequences of actions to goals. You consider the effect of things on human beings, and you use reason and evidence. The power of a secular moral system is that it is data-driven. It is able to correct itself. We can begin with those foundational principles, and if we find out any of them are wrong, any of them, including you know something that seems as obvious as life is preferable to death, we can change them. If it turned out, maybe we find out something about reality, that there is some kind of afterlife, and now death is preferable to life, and we've uprooted our foundation, we've done so based on evidence. If you do it before you get the evidence, you're a moron. <laughs> <laughs> this idea that there's no absolutes is also wrong, because within any specific situation, and there's no absolute, there's not one absolute, absolute moral answer that addresses every situation, but within a specific situation, I think there are absolutes. And that's because in a given situation, there's a finite pool of possible actions that one can take. We can compare the results of those actions with each other. Some of them are going to be better, and some of them are going to be worse, which means by definition, there is some subset of actions that represent the moral pinnacle for that particular situation. We may not have the first clue what it is, but we're never going to find out if we accept somebody else's bald-faced lie assertion about what it is. We have to explore, we have to investigate. We have been building off of what everybody before us has learned. If you ask, if you pull up a mid-game chess position and you ask a bunch of people, what's the best move? You might get a variety of answers. And they could be right. Doesn't necessarily have to be one right answer. We can get a couple not so good answers, a couple op optimal answers. But by and large, we're able to determine which answers are better and right. And it's the people, it's the experts that have studied chess who are able to see further. And they're the best ones at determining which moves are the right moves. 
The fact that there are multiple right answers doesn't mean that we just throw up our hands and forfeit the game. We've won. The fact that there are more multiple right answers means we're winning. <laughs> and it's the same thing is true, even though this is a, a common religious objection to morality is, well, you say this is right, and he says that's right. Yeah, you know what? We can both be right. This isn't, this isn't about just one simple, absolute, cut and dry path. That's the lie that religion has foisted upon the world. And it's really difficult to get past this. I can't, I, you know, in the, in, the, in the time we got today, I can't get into all of it. I do want to remind you that, that the whole talks are actually available online. But when we're kids, we ask why. A lot of times we got that, because I said so. That's religion. Religion is offering because I said so. And that answer might have been fine in humanity's infancy. But we're grown-ups now. We're not, you know, we don't know everything, but we ought to know enough. Because I say so is not a satisfying answer. And the reason it's not satisfying is because when we ask why, what we're looking for is an explanation, something with explanatory power that increases our understanding. Because I said so and God did it, those are pointless little platitudes. They're just, they're, they're, they're filler. They're filler. I, I don't want to answer your question. I don't have to answer your question. I don't have an answer to your question, but I'm damn sure going to pretend that I have one. And it's because I said so. We talk about why secular morality is superior. It's because we say so. And I don't know, I don't mean that in a morally relativistic way. I mean that we say so. And the reason we say so is because we have learned, we've been able to, you know, build off of the foundations that other people have left us and learn what works and what doesn't. And we also understand that we've got a lot more to learn. One of the best principles about secular moralities is that not only is it about getting better, but it's about getting better at getting better. We can revise every aspect of what we believe and what we understand, and it's all done based on evidence. Religious models, how do they deal with conflict? Coercion, conquest. It's not data-driven. It's not evidence-based. It's all because I said so. Because I said so is a terrible answer. It's unsatisfying. But because we say so is empowering. We're all participants in this system. Secular moral systems are internally driven. Non-secular systems are externally driven. There's no guarantee that, that the, 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 uh, the needs of the participants in the system are being looked after in any way by a non-secular system. It's somebody else's opinion. It's, I'm doing this for your own good. Well, I'm sure you think so, but are you really? And is that what's actually coming out of it? I don't know you. I'm sick of being viewed as a person of questionable moral character by people who support criminal organizations that shield child rapists. citizen to anybody who sanctions honor killings. I'm not, I'm not a second-class citizen. They don't have any moral high ground if they're fighting against all forms of equality, of equality uh, if they're retarding scientific progress, and if they're refusing medical treatment that results in kids dying, while simultaneously propping up those institutions as the best moral standards. It might be the best that they've got to offer but the rest of us have something more to offer. They can stand in their swamp all day and claim that they have it on good authority, that they are in the best position. But we have the moral high ground. It's, this battle has been fought and won. We are an evidence-based society. We understand what we can do with regard to morality. And whenever I'm in a debate, I'm gonna, I'm gonna cheat just a little bit here. Um, whenever I'm in a debate in the area of school, there's a part of me that just wants to go nuts. <laughs> there's a part of me that wants to say, well, Christianity breeds child rape. That's just, that's just as truthful as what you said. But I'm more moral than they are. Because I understand that Christianity doesn't actually have any tendency to lead to child rape, so I won't say it does. But what I will say is that it certainly doesn't have anything in it that prevents 
child rape. And meanwhile, we have example after example of all these religious atrocities, all while these people are running around singing hosannas and talking about how those dirty, godless heathens just can't be moral. You're just wrong. We have the moral high ground, absolutely. I'm going to let questions get up here, but I want to, I want to kind of end on a positive note. And that is the superior of a secular moral system is something that is not only true, but we know it's true because we can observe the religious. Religions don't still have the same view of morality that they used to. They've changed based on what the society that's changed around them, based on these secular views. They already acknowledge that our way is better. It's just that they're so entrenched in their way that they take these secular moral positions and say, this is my new external source, and then cover it up and slap you know, God on it or insight from Jesus. They're already agreeing to this. In the, in the future, religions are going to, most of them, are going to catch up. It happens all the time. And they'll color it and paint personal interpretation on it. But this is, this is just a simple win, a straight up win. They already acknowledge that the secular path is the best path. What we need to do is let encourage people that they don't have to be stealth secularists. You can actually be involved in the process. Yes, it's difficult, and I know the talks about morality and, and debates can cause conflict and be very, very difficult for people to deal with on occasion. But you can be a part of the process, and I am going to spend the rest of my life walking around in universities and in debates and on the TV show and on the podcast and maybe even occasionally on Godless Bitches, doing everything I can to make sure that religion never again gets to set the stage, define the terms, or get the last damn word. Thanks.